masterpiece. Feel like the last dude. I built the masterpiece. Learn the ghetto gospel after moving ghetto D. Had to bring it to the light for the world to see. Yeah, I'm back, back. I think I'm masterpiece. Feel like the last dude. I built the masterpiece. Learn the ghetto gospel after moving ghetto D. Had to bring it to the light for the world to see. These yeah. guys rub about it. I really live this shit. I was scraping up the block, I plead no innocence Living war rules of profit from my arrogance and So I teach the truth, living by commandments Spirit game strong, yeah, make sure you With the fringes, had to circumcise my heart And show you how I'm with the business He's so far back and know about revelation Chapter 2, verse 9, the sin of God say I teach my people blood Wonderful. Welcome back, everyone. Um, it's always an honor to be able to do the work of the Most High Yah. Um, I appreciate and I'm thankful um, for this forum. I have a lot of gratitude for um, the people who understand and who are really looking to have their lives like changed. You know, the more we keep learning, Better off, shalom, Aki. Um, shalom, Aki. It, so yeah, um, it's it's a good thing, and we need to be and we need to be excited about what we're doing. You know, even though we find out things that we really don't necessarily like, and what some a lot of times we find out things that we really don't understand, and often too we look at things and and it turns out to be different, and you know our mindset. Um, has to be changed, you know, because we're uh, we're exposed to a lot of things. Aki, you're gonna have to um, let me share on my screen. Um, I want to share a photo. I shared it earlier today, but I want to share it again, and I want everyone to kind of get the idea of what we're what we're trying to do and, and what. Um, not just what we're trying to do, but where we are with everything. You know, we have to understand. And often no one tells us what's going on. They just, you know, we just kind of follow what everybody else is doing. But I want to share this with you. Um, this photo I'm putting up here is a picture, it's a picture of some abstract art. Okay. And with it, you can't put your finger on anything. You don't know what it is. It's all over the place. Anybody can make anything out of it that they want to make it out of. Hebrew thought is not like this. Hebrew thought is very concrete. It's based on a root system. It's based on things that you can actually see, smell, taste, and touch, and hear while all of our senses. And so right here, when you try to make sense of this, this is English. <laughs> This is the English language, which causes us to come up with things and thoughts that, that doesn't make sense. We're trying to make sense of it, and it just doesn't make sense. And because of that, everyone is on a different page. Everybody is thinking differently. Israel is thinking like this as we, as we speak. They think like this, period, because they don't have anything that's definite and nothing that's concrete. Well, that's the difference between English and the Hebrew language. That's the difference between the Eastern mindset and the Western mindset. What you have here is the Western mindset. It can mean anything to anybody. I wanted to share that with you so you can kind of get a, a sense of what I'm trying to discuss with you. Again, just like Eastern and Western medicine, you know, the Western medicine treats the symptoms. They just care about what, how how things look on the outside or what someone just told you but they never really try to understand what the root of the problem is what's the root cause in our hebrew language there's root we call a root system in order for us to find out where something comes from or originates from then we'll have a better understanding of what it is and what its function is okay so we don't we don't just you know, treat symptoms, but we look for the actual root cause of the problem. And that's even in the, in the language, okay? Um, and as you notice in the Eastern medicine, just like the Eastern thought, they deal with everything that's physical. 
it's things that they put your hands on, you know, acupuncture, they stick needles in you, you know, naturopathic herbs that come out of the ground, cupping and, and massage are all physical hormone therapies, things to, to kind of, you know, find out where you're at because they understand how your body works. Okay. Cause they want to know what the root cause is. But when you're dealing with other things and drugs and surgeries and stuff like that to eliminate or control symptoms, then, you know, you don't really find out what the problem is. You're just trying to cut something off and thinking that's going to help. Okay. So you say, well, why are you mentioning this? Well, because the language and the mindset is the most important part of your culture. We're Afro-Asiatic people. Okay, oh, that's a little one. <laughs> We're Afro-Asiatic people. Okay, and uh, so with that being said, let's get into our lesson. Today, I'm going to share some other letters with you. Um, that's part of the Hebrew tongue, the, the ancient Hebrew, not the, um, not the modern Hebrew. Okay, this is biblical Hebrew which we find out how things work, where did it come from, so forth and so on, okay? Let me get my document here. Disappeared. All right. There we go. Stop the share, come back and do another share. All right. Here we are. We talked about the Aleph. Okay, strength to teach. We're just going to do a basic review. That's what the letter looks like. It's the first letter. It's number one, the Aleph. Okay, you want to practice writing it. The good thing to do is go on Google and it'll show you how to do it. It's not a problem. They give you directions. Go down and come across and then come here. You have to practice that. So I would recommend every day you write out the letters that you learn. You know, if you just want to go like this, it's still the same thing. That Aleph is still the same thing, okay? They put a little cursive here, right? And then they show you how to do that. And you just practice. That's all it is. It's practicing, okay? Strength, teacher, leader. The bet talks about the tent, the house, the dwelling, the family. Functions, the in, the out, you know, the with, all these different types of things. Somewhere where you would live inside. That's how it's written. Second letter. Third letter is called Gom, what they call the Gamil. It means the foot to travel, walking, the growth, and weaning, the development. Why? Because this letter is used in all of those words like the, the Gaul or the Ragel or the, um, the Gadol. Is, they use the Gamil for that. And it's written like this. You have different scripts. Different scripts mean it's just the way that they decided to write it. You know, sometimes it could be like this. Just depends how you want to write it. Okay. But it's not the writing that's important. It's what the understanding of the letter is. So Aleph, Beg, Gimel. And the next one is Dalit. And the Dalit is the, the idea of a door. Okay. Movement. Because that's what a door does. It moves back and forth. It dangles. And it's always connected to the tent door. Okay. The door, the Dalit, easy to remember. Letter D is Dalit. Okay. Cover our next letter, which is the the fifth letter. It's called Hey. Hey, like Hey, behold. A sigh, like Oh, look at that. You know, a breath to look at a great sight. Revelation, something is being revealed that causes you to take have to take a breath. That's the letter hey. Very distinctive. It's a line and has this as another thing. And here's a space right here. So you know that's not connected. That's a hey. You're going to see some letters that are very similar. So today we're going to talk about the next five letters. Then also, too, we're going to have a little introduction to the letter Aleph and how and what it how it sounds and if it does have a sound. And then how that works, I'm going to give you a little bit of information on that, because I believe if I kind of want to give you a little bit of everything at a time, not too much, but just enough to kind of spark your interest and keep you interested in the game so you can move along. 
because when we teach, we have to teach like we're teaching children again, because this is something you've never known. You can learn this. You already know this, by the way. Um, to kind of, when I say you already know it, what I mean is this. Just like everything about the seed of us has been traveling down from, from generation to generation to generation, this language is already in us. The ideas and concepts are already there. For example, you already know how to, to pronounce a lot of these letters. You just didn't know their names. That's all. But you know how to still go ah, b, s, you know, g, d, h, h, you know, s, k, w. You already know how to say those things. It's already in you. Okay. Now, what we're doing is we're re sparking the energy. Okay. And what we're doing is we're causing the brain to work in a different way. The brain is going to start thinking from this direction now versus us going from reading from right, uh, from left to right, like we're doing right here, the original picture graph. That's how our brain has been looking because our eyes are directly connected to our brain. So we think in this, this way right here, go that way. Well, in the Hebrew, what we're going to be doing is we're going this way first. We're going to read in Hebrew and then we're going to translate in English. So all the whole time, what your brain is doing is we're thinking this way from right to left. So everything is going in a circle. And then your circuits are connected. You're creating a, a cycle. This is what makes you smart. Okay. So you're going in like this in a cycle. You know, you're going to be saying something in Hebrew and then you're going to go ahead and translate it in English. Say it in Hebrew and translate it in English. And so it's going back and forth. Okay. And it's a circuit. Um, I want you to understand that the ancient Hebrew here, the word is called wa. Okay. I got vav up here because I wanted to let you know that this is the Ashkenazi's way of changing our letters. They've changed our letter from a W sound, right, to a V sound. Va, 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 va. And that's not in the Hebrew um, vernacular. We do have a sound for a V sound, but we don't have the letter V in our in our in our tongue. The Hebrew tongue is a wa, 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 wa. Okay. So the original picture graph used in the early, early Semitic script is a picture of a tent peg. Okay. And I'm going to show you what it looks like. And the tent pegs were made from wood, and sometimes they were made from other materials, and may have been like a Y-shaped. Uh, to prevent the rope from slipping off, okay? Um, it's going to be kind of like this, like this. So in your picture graph that I sent to you, it will show you it's like a Y. And so they put the rope on it so the rope can't come off of it, right? So it says the modern Hebrew name for this is called, is, see, they got the, it's Wa. It's right here. Wa is the modern name. It means a peg or a hook. That's what it means. It's making a connection, okay? It's called a wa, wa. It's also used as a conjunction, okay? So I put some pictures up here to kind of give you an idea of what they were looking like, tent pegs, like this, you know, when they got it right here, or you can see there, they tie the ropes to it, okay? So basically a tent peg, as you can notice that this is something that connects you to the tent, which has to do with the house, which is the bet. It's all interconnected. The dalit has to do with the door of the tent. The, the wa has to do with the tent peg. And what it does is add stability to the house and it secures something, the rope to the ground and the ground to the tent. That's why they use it in Hebrew as the word and. It's a conjunction. So anytime in Hebrew you're reading, it would say, you know, wa this or wa that or wa this or wa that. It means a continuation, okay? It's a connection. So it connects one thought to the next. This is a reason why they're using it. I want to give you an example right quick and show you what I'm talking about, okay? Of course, here's what it looks like before we go. I want to show you. They got, you know, it looks like this. You know, it could be cursive style. It could be a, a block style straight like this, okay? And also, too, it can have this big bulky look like that, okay? 
But there's other letters as well that kind of look like this, which is called a noon. A noon looks like that too, it's just longer, okay? We'll get more into that later. But as you want to know, it's called a wa, not a vav. It's not a vav, it's a wa. Wa. So when you say, just say wa. That's where they hear they get the name Yahoo Wa, because it, it's a Wa in there. It's a Yod. Hey. Wa. Hey. Yo hey wa hey. Yo hey wa hey. This is the four letters of the what they call the Tetragrammaton, but it's the holy name of the creator. Yohe Wahe. Okay. And what they do is some people call them Yohu Wa. Okay. I call him Yahawa. Yahwa. Okay. Halu Yawa. Yawa. Yahwa. Okay. You could call them, some people call them Yahweh. You know, so if you notice they're using the same letters, they're just switching out the vowels because they really don't know. Well, what's the proper pronunciation? Is it? Yohe is a Yahweh, is a Yohweh, is a Yoho, Yoa, is a Yawa. What is it? Well, no one knows. Okay. Um, me, I, I, I used to call him Yahweh. And then I looked at it and I said, I don't see a, 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 a there. I see a Wa, ah, Yawa. So I call him Yawa. The essence of his name is the one who is the self existing one. He exists. Because a yod right there is he, and then hawa is it to exist, okay? So he's saying he exists. And a yod is a hand. <laughs> the yod is a hand, okay? That's where we get our word yod. And yod means hand, okay? His hand has worked. His hand has done everything. But I want to show you what it looks like, and I want to give you some insight on this letter before we go any further. Let me pull up another screen here. Um, let me pull up here. Let's get it. And feel free to ask any questions because this is your time. This is your time. This is your learning experience. And I want you to enjoy it, okay? So the first book that I wanted to share with you about this why is, of course, the first time that is mentioned, okay? The first time it's mentioned is in the book of um, Bereshit, which we have here in Genesis. You know, it says, uh, you know, Bereshit the Bader Elohim the Ed the Hashamayim. And then it has a wa right here. And they have it as a conjunction. And then they have what they call a direct object marker, which we'll get into later. Don't worry about what this F is. I'll tell you what that is later. I just want to show you the wa. So we have a wa there. We got a wa there. And it means and, and, okay? And then let's continue on. What it is, it's, it's letting us know that what I just said, I'm connecting the heavens and the earth. And then I'm also gonna show you over here, we have another wa. I'm just gonna highlight it right here in the Hebrew. So we got it right there where it says and void, and then we got another wa. And then we got, and this is like, and then we got another one, and the spirit, right? Keep just they're there, they're all over the place. Okay. And then we have in verse number three, you know, we got another one, and there was light, and then we got another word, and he saw. So I wanted to share that with you because I need you to understand something about this letter. This letter is very powerful. There's over 50,000 laws in the Torah. 50,000 of them. Okay. So what the law is doing is it's making connections over with things. <clears throat> and so often, too, in the Torah, you, you will see when the Holy One of Israel has written something. In English, they'll put a period and they'll begin another chapter. Okay. <laughs> I'm laughing because I, when I discovered this is crazy. Let me show you an example. Um, in the book of Daniel, okay, it's a hot book. 
<laughs> it's hot. <laughs> and it's in chapter number 12. And they begin to talk. They try to, you know, they get us pumped up. And you know, everyone loves this because this is your, you know, this is where they get the idea and the concept from eternal life. <laughs> which of course, if you're in my class, you know that life is your stomach in Hebrew, right? So I want you to look at the first verse in chapter number 12, okay? <laughs> what do you see? What's the first letter? Let's say it together. It is a wa. It's the first letter. It's a wa. And what does a wa mean? <laughs> Somebody, come on, class. We just went over it. What does it mean? Grammatically, it means and. Okay. So, why would they put a wa right here in the first verse of chapter number 12? <laughs> because what is a continuation? Yes, 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 yes. Okay. So it means that everything that was said before this goes with everything that's going to be said. <laughs> right? So, so, so we're really, when you look at a scroll, should you be starting in verse number one? No. No. This means that I need to go back and read chapter number 11. <laughs> then you'll find out she's supposed to be in chapter number 10 as well. Because Michael's name is, Mikhail's name is not mentioned just here. His name is mentioned all over the place. So you want to find out the proper context of something. You just can't go to one chapter and start there and think you got a new doctrine. You have to be able to understand what that letter wa is. It means and. It's a continuation of a thought and adding. It means that it not only and, it connects. It's making a connection between what is being said here and what was said back in the other chapters. Does that make sense? Yeah, it should. it should. Okay. So let me let me show you something else now that I'm, I'm on it. I just wanted to show you that. So, you know, they got their title up here, Deliverance and End Times. <laughs> and then they could got you connected to Revelation. Yeah, it goes together. Yes, this goes together. And it's not. It's not. <laughs> That's all another lie, okay? My job as your teacher is to tell you where the lies are and then make you sharp, okay? I gotta keep you sharp. So one of the things that we need to understand too, I'm gonna show you one more example. So I told you there's 50,000 of these, which I don't expect you to remember. You don't know where all 50,000 are, but what you will know is this. You'll understand that when y'all, had Moshe write the Torah, okay? It was a continuous message that was on a scroll, okay? So we're in the book of Leviticus in it, you know, in the Greek writings, okay? They're the ones who named it because it talks a lot about Levi. So they named Leviticus, <laughs> you know? But the real name is called Wayikra, okay? That's the true name, Wa Yikra, okay? And so here, what do we have? We have the first letter of this in particular part of the scroll is a what? <laughs> and, wow. And so in the scroll, this just basically means a continuation of what was just said. So is there a division between, what's the book that came before Leviticus? Name the books. Yeah, it was Exodus. Genesis and Exodus, but Exodus is really called Shemot. Okay. So Shemot is, is a Shemot and Leviticus go what? Coincide together. They coincide together. It's an and. See, it's not like he wrote a book and then stopped and then later on decided to write another book. <laughs> no, it's a scroll. It's a it's a literal scroll a Hebrew scroll. And what it is, it continues and goes on and on and on. So it wasn't just he stopped and said, well, uh, well, let me call this book this. No, the reason why they name it, it is because when he transitions 
he makes a transition and he says, Wayikra. Okay. That means and to Moshe he spoke. Now in Hebrew, every one of the scrolls or the, the divisions in the scrolls is identified by its name. So instead of it being Leviticus, it is Wa. Okay. Yikra. Wa Yikra. Okay. If you look the um Ashkenazis, they turn around and call it via Yikra. Okay. Okay. But all this basically means and he called, not and called, and he called. And then he here, because it's third person masculine singular, is the creator. That's how this book, this in particular scroll is called. So they gave it this, this name. And then the, the Greeks came along and changed it and called it Leviticus because it primarily talks about the roles and responsibilities of the tribe of, of the Levites and of the Levi, the Kohanim, okay? So they're compound words. Why here just means and he, and then Yikra is called, you see? So you see how the why is used to say and it's a conjunction. Now it says here, and that's that wa, and then called, but they don't tell you who's doing the calling. So this is where people get confused, unless you understand the text. So I want to show you something. Just where it says why you cross is how you say it. Okay, that's how you say it. They got why, but it's why. Yeah, why? Yeah, why? Yikra, why yikra? Okay. But let me show you what the word means. Called for us is something in the Hebrew different than what it is, what they're like, they like to say. Okay. They call it call. Okay. He called. Okay. Now look at all the different words that they use here to tell you about what it means. Our understanding from English to call means to get on the phone and maybe make a call or to yell out to, okay? But here it means to proclaim, and it also means to read. So how do you know which one it is? You know, to call, to call out something, proclaiming. Proclaim means to, you know, you have to read something, okay? So when the Holy One of Israel, you see right here is called kara. That's the root of the verb, okay? Kara, okay? Transliteration means they're going to put it in. Um, I think we talked about this before, but I'll go over it right again with you. Each one of these letters represent, those are English letters that represent the Hebrew letters. So there's the Hebrew Q, and there here's the Hebrew R, and here's the Hebrew um, vowel as an A right here, okay? Because the letter Aleph is not, it serves both as a consonant and a vowel, which is something totally different. It's into a grammar. We'll get more into that. But what I want to let you know is, is that you notice that it doesn't tell you um, let you know who's doing the calling. Look at all these different letters and words that they translate it into. They become become famous, really. Call, calling, calls, gives, grasps, yes, invite, invited, made, proclamation, make a proclamation, men of renown, mention, name, 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 offer terms, proclaim. So which one is it? <laughs> you see? So all this causes confusion. It all causes confusion like that picture that I showed you. Do you see how they can take it and it can turn into whatever it means? It can mean a lot of different things. So, and these are what they would call abstract thinking. They're making it to where, that's why it's called a translation. So the people that translated our language are people who take what we said or what the Holy One of Israel said, and they put it in the words that make sense to them. And that's where the problems are. Because on one hand, they say call and read. Another one, they say live. Invited is used 14 times. See? You have to start thinking about it. Look, read 35 times. They got proclaimed here two times. Proclaims twice. Summon, you know, makes sense. Sue, they use it for suing. See? So it's all over the place. 
They even have it 19 times for crying. And Hebrew has a word for crying. They got several words for crying because it, it, it depends on how you're crying. Some crying is mourning. Some crying is crying out. Some crying is um, out of uh, you know grief and sorrow. There's all different types of ways. So when we look at this, we, we, the way that we've been programmed is that we look at everything in a very you know, simplistic way. We just want to get right to it. We don't want to take time to dig in and find out what it means. But that's why you're learning the Hebrew, so you can go beyond that. So you can see right here, kara is the actual root. And then you got this wa here that means he, and then the an. Once you know what the letters are, you'll be able to say something. So you know what the wa means now, so you'd be like and when you see it. But you also know what it means. See, in English, they, they tell you, you know, when, when they say and in English, you and I be like, oh, it just goes, it's with that. But you and I can't uh, attach this letter to a tent peg. It's a peg. <laughs> it's a connector. See, so our language has significance because we can identify with these things. This is this and here is abstract. It means nothing to us in English. Now that you're understanding Hebrew, it means a tent peg. It means making a connection and is used for 50,000 times. So when Yah is spoken all these different times, he's making these connections. So we don't separate our books and what was written. We understand that it was written in a scroll format. And once we know that, when we're reading, we're all like, oh, that goes with that. Oh, that goes with that. So there's different ways that Yah has, is he's communicating to us. We know what you're going to learn is that this word right here doesn't mean just two. It has significance so far that you've already learned the letter Aleph, you know it means strength. You already know it means strong and strength, the function of it. A bull, you already know that. Something that's sturdy and durable, enduring, something that, that's uh, very powerful. You also know it means to teach. And then they got this letter right here, which means you haven't got there yet, but I'll tell you what it is. It's a shepherd's staff. It's a shepherd's staff. And so when it talks about a shepherd's staff, a strong staff, a strong staff, yeah, what kind of staff? A strong staff. And they're using it for the word just to mean two. Well, for us, that's the abstract. That's the picture that I showed you. We don't know that what that can mean. We don't know really what that means. You know, we, we got an idea. You know, we have to look and find out what it means. Like, oh, okay, it's going, it's going somewhere. That's an abstract concept in the Hebrew language, you see? So when you look at the word too here, it's their language. When you said and called, it's not telling you. It's just giving you what they want to say, you see? And then they have stuff like Moshe, which is the truth, which is his name. But even his name has significance. His name means the one who's drawn out, to draw out, right? So when we read it, we're decoding what these things mean, okay? So an average person will read this and says, and call to Moses, okay? A Hebrew person will look at it and say, connected, he proclaimed, okay, meaning read, the strong staff pointing directly to, because that's what a staff does, a strong staff is used to point somewhere somewhere, so what he's using is whatever this is saying, whatever is called or proclaimed is strong. It's a strong and it's going to be towards this person. It's a strong staff. So why, why is Yah using this word L? Because he's letting you know anytime you see the L, it's a strong staff. And a strong staff is a staff that Yah puts in his, in his hand to direct his people. So Moshe was under authority. He was, a, he was a ram among us. He's a leader of us. But even the leaders have to go under a strong authority because the staff is used for, for guidance, but it's also used for authority. So also, too, you understand that when a shepherd called, because that's what a shepherd does, when a shepherd calls, okay, you and I will look at this, and he, the he here is Yahweh, the strong shepherd, he called to his to with his strong authority to Moshe the one he drew out which is our leader so there's a group of just picture a group of um animals 
and he says, Moshe. And then Moshe, out of all the animals, out of the herd, the leader is coming to the shepherd. He's responding to the shepherd. And then the shepherd, the he again is the one who called out, is the one who's now going to speak to him and give him words. Because Devar means words. And you see the and again. Okay. So when a Hebrew person will look at this, we look at it differently. We, we break everything down and we understand what it means. And that's the and that's and that's the beauty of the language, because we're not saying he called to Moses. That's simple, like you call it to a child. No, we understand what's here. There's authority here. There's power here. So we know that and who that power is, the one who's the one who has the shepherd, the staff in his hand, and that's why Yah turned around and put a staff in his hand when he sent him to the children of Israel. And a matter of fact, Yah gave him a staff. And put it in his hand and said, use this as, as your authority. See? So that's why we look at this language the way that we do. Any questions so far? <laughs> Very powerful. <laughs> yeah, this is deep, all right? Yeah. Yeah, because we, we know, look, we know. We know that, that he that spoke is Yahweh. He is the... He is the uh, He's the subject of the verb. He's the one doing the action. He's the one who spoke. He's the one who proclaimed to, with his strong authority to Moshe. And he told him the words, okay? Words. And words here is not just words. It's not just words. It's an arrangement. <laughs> it's an arrangement how things, because words are given in letters, and then letters become words. And then words become instructions, okay? So what I'm teaching you is I'm teaching you letters. And then after you learn the letters, then you'll learn the words. And basically, the book of Deuteronomy, which is called Davarim, has to do with this idea of, of, of to speak or a word, arrangement. They got here speak. Oh, it means to speak. Oh, that's very basic. Oh, but look. Look at all the different translations. Boasting, command, counsel, declare past sentence proclaimed oh really so now we got the same word for proclaimed as kara and now you're saying it is debar too said repeated you know saying speaking telling talk utter right so they got all these different things but when you look at the hebrew on it it'll tell you exactly what it means <laughs> it's not on accident people so when you when you get involved and you get in engrossed in this you'll be like wait a minute that doesn't mean just that it means something else so they got all these different places where the word is used and so forth and so on and they do this on purpose to confuse you to make you not want to research it to find out what it means okay but look what it says it gives a little bit more information about an answer to a point a bid a command a commune a device a declare primitive root perhaps properly to arrange like I said, because that is the primitive root. Because remember, we don't look at the, the, the symptoms, we look at the root. So the root is to arrange. They say use figuratively of words, okay, to speak, because when you speak, you're talking about words, but in a destructive sense, it means to subdue. Do you know the same word for devar means thing or plague? Y'all can use that same word for a plague because it's a thing, okay? So when we get a little bit deeper into our Hebrew, I, I, I'm, I'm showing you that even from their translations, they're still not telling you everything there is. They're, they're not. They'll tell you how many times they use it. They'll tell you how many times it's being used, you know, and where it's being used at. But if you don't understand, it's used over uh, 1,144 times. And out of the 1,144 times, it's never used in the New Testament whatsoever. <laughs> Again, making a clear distinction between your language and your culture. See, these people have stole our culture, okay? So <laughs> it's our job to go in and hunt and find out what's going on. <laughs> Pretty powerful. <laughs> All right, the next letter I want to talk to you about is called Zan, okay? Zan, ah, Zan. That's the ancient, Zan, okay? Zan but they're going to change the name because they're moving away from the ancient 
and they're going to move into what they call a more modern name of it that people recognize. But again, the ancient is Zan, but the new and improved one they call is called Zayin. Okay. This ancient pictograph is a letter of some type of agricultural implement. Okay. Um, is similar to a homotic or a, a plow. And I'll show you what a picture looks like of that. The meaning of this letter is harvest or crop because instruments of agriculture have to do with food, has to do with the crops. And is as a, this is a tool used as har in harvesting for food. You know, a harvest is to cut because you got to cut. When you harvest, you're cutting something. So there's a tool that is used to cut stuff, okay? And that's the reason why I believe, um, I don't know if I have this right. Uh, let me pull up. I'll show you guys because I think last time someone asked me about it and I wasn't able to, um, I wasn't able to. I said something and then he said, once you pull up the picture of it to show us where it's at so you can kind of get the idea. I didn't write it down. I just don't want to do the picture the wrong way. I want you to actually see what it looks like. Uh, okay. It's always difficult trying to find these things. Um, I hate having to search for it because it cuts into my my teaching time. Anyway, um, where is it? Is that it? Yeah. Okay, that's it. Perfect. All right, so let me share this. Hmm. Uh, uh, share, share. Go here. Okay. Share that. Wow. All right. So in this one here, this is your Hebrew alphabet chart, okay? And what we have here, we're talking about the um, seventh letter. So the, the wa right here is the sixth letter, the tent peg, the wa, okay? Right here, it looks like a little Y, but it's a Y, that's a picture of it. Over time, it's been changing in the paleo and all this, and it finally ended up being this. And then because the Ashkenazis in them got a, got a hold of it, right? They wanted to change it. They call it a vav. But by the way, the wa, because that's what it is, it's always been a wa. They use it for the letter W and the letter O and the letter U. So this in particular letter here, which is a wa, forget this, is not a vav. It's a wa. Is used as a letter W, it could be used as a letter O, and is used for the letter U for the vowels. Okay. This the ancient, you know, paleo. So there's like, oh, the paleo is the one. No, it's not. It's the tent peg, it's the picture. Okay. But guess what? The letter has never changed. The image has never changed. The tent peg is always what it's going to be. That's the origin of it. Okay. In Arabic, and you can verify this in Arabic, they use the wa, they use this letter. They call it the wa, just like we do. So they get their language from us, okay? It's, it's based off of our language, okay? So that's the six letter, which is the wa. Now we're talking about, so that's six. This over here is the five, fifth letter and so on, fourth for the dalit, okay? And you got 10 fingers, so you'd be able to do aleph, bet, gimel, dalit, hey, okay? And then we have number seven, okay? The seventh is Zan, which they call Zion. It's a Madak. And this is what the picture looks like. It's a cutting instrument. Okay. It's used to harvest. It's used to cutting. And over time, it went from that picture and it traveled over here to this. And then it traveled over here to this. And then it traveled over here into this. And guess what letter they use it for in English? Somebody tell me. <laughs> They use it for the letter Z. Z, 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 Z. 
See see how it looked? It looks like an ancient, it looks like a Z. That's why they call it Zion. And here's the what they use in modern for it. Okay. So as you notice, a lot of these letters, this is the letters they're using it for, the H, the D, the W, the Z, the H, the TH, the Y, L, M. It's all there. You already know it. They, all they've done is, is removed the names of these letters. You already know the sounds. You just forgot the names. But also, too, you forgot what they represent because you haven't been around this stuff. You don't understand what this stuff means. You got a hand, but you don't know how it was used. <laughs> you, you, you know what I'm saying? You, you know what these things are, but they're not around you all the time. You and I live in what they call a house now. So we don't even think about a tent. We don't think about a tent peg because we're not around it. All right. And this right here is used for the, for the, the cutting. Okay. Which is what we're talking about. Let me go here. So what we're trying to do is wrap our mind around these concepts, okay? We want to wrap our mind around them, and, as, and, and it can be difficult because we don't know anything but what's in front of us. So that's why you have to turn your brain back over to the other side. You have to move from, um, from the Western culture, where you've been brought to, and you have to go to the East. You have to get an Eastern mindset, okay, instead of a Western mindset. We were here... And then we have been brought into captivity to here. And then the creator says for us to turn around and start thinking back and going back here, back to where we came from. So that's called in Hebrew, shuv. That means, you know, uh, to repent, to turn. And you're turning back from captivity, okay? So you're brought into captivity, right? And then once you get here, you're supposed to go through this idea of shuving. And shuving means to turn back, to go back to the east, to go back where you came from. And on the, uh, on the way back to going from the east back here, going from the west to the east, excuse me, you're going to hit all these different places where you used to go, where you came from. You'll start doing your research. You're going to find out I'm Afro-Asiatic. You're going to find out we used to live in tents. You're going to find out how we, we de depended on the land. You're going to find out we're agricultural people. You're going to find out there were Afro-Semitic. You're going to find out how we dealt with everything, marriage, children, everything. You're going to find those things out. Because your brain is being changed and it's going back this direction. You see? So it's a changing of one's mind, okay? And that's the returning. So when Yah asks us to return back to him, he's saying, you started here and I sent you over here. And now that you're here, I want you now to turn and come back over, turn back to me this way, okay? So I sent you here. <laughs> to give you time to think about it. And then when you're here, you start thinking and then you'll turn back and you'll come back this way. You'll come back. But you have to do it in a manner that has to bring you back. He said, just start thinking about it, all right? So Zan is an ancient pictograph for that, okay? So also too, it has to do with the idea of food because food has to do with agriculture, right? And so um, um, harvesting and cutting and it's an implement for, and it means broad meaning from its shape because it's very broad um there's a word for idolatry or adultery excuse me it's called zana okay that's what it's called a zana okay and zana is adultery and adultery if you look at it and what it has is root in here zan is in it so what is adultery adultery is literally harvesting from a land that doesn't belong to you. Okay. It's a literal cutting and harvesting something that doesn't belong to you. The commandment is that we should not go into another man's field and go cut and harvest for anything. Okay. That's a commandment. When a person commits adultery, Okay, they're going in and they're harvesting, but also too, they're cutting. They're cutting off the relationship. They're cutting off between the covenant. Okay, uh, I, uh, adultery also has to do with idolatry. Idolatry has to do with adultery. Okay, 
So it has to do with this idea of cutting. It has to do with the idea of harvesting, okay? It has the idea of, of, of food and, and nourishment, okay? And you are using an instrument, an implement to do this. And in this case, you know, um, when a man commits adultery, he uses his, and when a woman uses adultery and a man does adultery, they use their bodies, right? They use, of course, a man has his instrument, his implement, and she's the field, okay? When you commit idolatry, you're using something other than your body parts. You're using your mind. Israel used their minds and what they were doing was they took what Yah gave them, which is the harvest and the, and the crops, and you'll find this in the book of Hosea, and they began to give those crops and harvest to their gods, okay? And so idolatry is the giving of one's mind, and adultery is where it starts. Adultery starts in the mind, okay? And then you, you graduate from adultery Okay, because of the idolatry. An adulteress is the one who's in, interested in idolatry. When Yah talks about killing the adulteress, he's literally talking about getting rid of idolatry. If you commit idolatry, you're going to commit adultery. If you commit adultery, you've already committed idolatry. That's why Yah is very, very hard on us. That's why he will kill because he's jealous. This is, this is automatic death. And this is why Yah will cut us off. You see. <laughs> very powerful. His language is very, very powerful. Because it opens up your mind. The instrument, again, is it's an implement. Okay, It's a cutting. So as we saw in our, our picture graph, it's, I think... Uh, I think it's I think it was this way yeah yeah so this is a cutting instrument okay um and it has that z look like i think it's like here it's a cutting instrument okay so you can see right here it looks the same it's coming here you see see it's cutting it's going into the ground this part right here is what we see right here okay and then it digs all the way through the soil so it has to do with cutting and crops, harvesting. Okay, we talked about that. And look who's pulling this instrument. Oh, so the strength of an ox again. So there's a connection with the Aleph, right? See? So you can see that for us, our lifestyle consists of these things. And it's, a, it's for a reason. We're, we, we're agricultural people, and uh, because we are those people, and that's who we are, Yah wants us to start thinking agriculturally. He wants you to start thinking about harvesting and crops and cutting and implements. He wants us to start thinking about soil, you know, where you put your fruits and everything. He wants us to start thinking about how hard the ground is. He wants us to look up into the skies and see that's where the rain comes so it can make this ground right here grow. He wants us to see the animals. That's why he gave us the animals because the animals are the ones, if you notice two of them, so they're yoked together to pull this into the ground in order to plow, in order for us to plant seed, in order for us to have a harvest eventually. That means there is work that needs to be done. And as we stated, the Aleph is the, is the more mature ox. The stronger ox is over here, and he's attached to the little baby ox or the younger ox, and they're joined together, and their job is to pull this to harvest the land, which is a picture of Yah joining himself with Israel to join and put the yoke on the neck to connect us with him so you and I will learn how to plow the earth and plant seeds of righteousness because we're an agricultural people. That's why you have animals. So yeah, I can talk to us. And also too, that's why there's different laws about how if your ox gorges someone or acts or misbehaves or, 
or whatever, if someone gets lost, if one gets lost, how are you supposed to reimburse it? If you stole it, you got to, you know, pay five times more, so forth and so on. So this is a lot deeper than us just talking. Okay. And again, this is what the letter looks like. You know, this is the block way it looks. Different ways that they write it. Okay. A little cursive. Okay. Zion. 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 Okay. Zion. The next letter that we want to go over is called a ket. Here we put two H's together to let you know that's a hard CH sound. K -k 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 ket. Okay. Ket. The ancient pictograph of this is a picture of a tent wall. Okay. So the meanings of this letter are outside because when, you know, as the function of the wall is outside to protect the occupants on the inside from the elements on the outside. Half as the wall in the middle of the tent divides the tent into the male and female sections because we all have to have our own sections, our privacy, and, and the secular as something that is outside. So if you think about the wall, the wall's function is to divide, it's also to separate, okay? So you'll also see this letter used a lot when you're talking about separation and division and protection, okay? So one of the words that I, I think I brought up to you before, and I'll, I'll put it in um, the, uh, in the Hebrew, it is word called ak. Okay, it's an aleph, which means what? What does the aleph mean? Strong. That's the, that's what it means. It's strong, like an ox. Okay, strong. Leader, chief. Okay, and then we have our next letter, which we call here the ket. And it's like this. Ket. Okay. And that's called what? Ah, k, ah, k, ah. I'll transliterate it up here for you. Ak. Ak. What's an ak? Oh, uh, kind of like like uh basically what a brother. It's a brother. So when we think about a brother. And also the sister, she, she uh, shares the same letter too, because if you have Ak, then her name is Akot. So she's an A in English, C-H, and then she's an O-T, Akot. That's a, that's a sister. So Akot is a sister and a brother is an Ak, okay? And I'm going to tell you how, what that, that, uh, OT means later on when we get into our stuff. She's a sister. So what is a brother and a sister? What do they really represent? A strong what? Family. Union. A cat is a wall. They're a strong wall. Your brother and sister are strong walls, and they're supposed to do something. They're supposed to protect the occupants from the elements. They, they're the ones who protect what's on the inside from that which is on the outside. So basically what's on the inside, where are they inside? Where do they live? In the tent. In a tent, and a tent represents what? F-A-M? Family. Family. Because that's where the family lives and they dwell inside the tent. The family dwells in the tent. Okay. So when we have the family of Yaakov, because he calls them the house, or listen to me, you family, you children of Yaakov, house of Israel, a house meaning tent, a place, a bet, okay, a bayit. There's the word for house is bayit, bayit of Yisrael, bayit. So the family. The family of Israel lives in a tent. We're, so, and who's the father of the tent? Yahweh. Yahweh is. And so he's the strong, he's the Av. 
He's the strength of the 10. He's called the Av. Right here. He's the Av. Right here. He's in charge of the 10, of the family. You see? And as brothers and sisters, you and I are supposed to be a strong wall of protection. From and we've got to protect everybody inside the house, the family. And we protect them from that which is on the outside of the house. You understand? But even within the house, there's a wall that separates us. That's why when our women go to different congregations or different places together, and when we were together as Israel, he would separate the men from the women. You see? Because Yah believes in separation. Separation is appropriate, okay, in different times and different manners, okay? So something that is on the outside is something that's on the other side of the wall, okay? There's another word that before we go on that talks about what Yah tells us that he is. Yah says that he's what? Shema Yisrael, Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh what? Eh, Kad. Echad. And Echad is spelled, I'm about to show you, right here. The E is represented by this Aleph in the, what, the tent wall. And then the Dalit. Oh. Echad. That means one. Isn't that what a Yah is? Echad is one. Right? So we have a strong wall. Right here, strong wall. And then there's a door. <laughs> because the wall is to separate us that from the inside from the outside. So when Yah is talking about he's a cod, okay, I'm gonna clean this up a little bit so we could get a little bit better way so much because there's a lot on this this chart here. I'm gonna clean it up. Now that you know what a ak is and aki is uh, a coat is and kept. This is a very important principle. It's a break, and it's, it's the most important thing you need to understand. Yah says that he's a cod. He told Israel that he's a cod. Okay, that's an aleph. Look at me trying to be fancy the way I wrote that. Ket, which is the wall, and the dalit, which is the door, which is the three letters that you've learned so far. Strength, wall, and door. The strong wall has a door. <laughs> the wall is supposed to, the strong wall is supposed to separate the outside from, I mean, the, in, the things on the inside from the outside. Okay. So when Yah's talking about he's a cod, right, he wants us to understand something. There is a division between Yah and, and the world. He separates himself from everyone else. And the only way that you can get to him is you got to go through the door. Like you would if you want to go into a room. In your house, you have walls that separates different places, okay? They separate. This is where they get the concept where in the New Testament, it talks about I am the door. This is where they get it from. There's walls in your, in your house. But there's also doors, okay? And what Yah does is he's saying this. I'm in one space, right? And you're in another space. And between us, there's a door, okay? And what we have to do is I have to open this door. We got to open that door. And when we open that door, I'm going to show you. I'm going to, I'm going to do a little diagram here. I'm going to give you a, a floor plan right here, just a regular room, okay? In this house or in this place, there's a wall. Here's the wall. And what separates those two spaces is what they call a door here, right here, okay? If you notice on floor plans, sometimes they have the door that looks like that, okay? If Yah is a cot, he's saying this. He's saying that where I am, Okay, and where you are, right? I'm in the in the heavens. I'm beyond the heavens of the heavens. Okay, and you're on the earth. 
And what I want to do is I want to join these two places together. I want them to become together. I want unification between that which is on the earth and that which is in the heavens. So when I talk about being a cop, what I'm saying is I'm, I'm introducing myself to you. I'm going to open the door for you to have a relationship with me. So wherever I am, you, you, you will understand. We'll have, a, we'll have a, a relationship. You see, we can't have this relationship as it stands right now when this door is closed. It's no, there's no unification between the two places. Yah wants to bring, he wants to join two places together, which is the earth. And he wants to join the earth to the heavenlies. And you say, well, what do you mean by that? What I'm saying is Yah wants us to join the earth to the heavens. Through what? Through obedience to his words. He wants a relationship with his creation. And he chose us to be the people to facilitate it. That's why he calls us a, a kingdom of priests. Because right now, when he talks about unification, so right now over here on earth, there's all these gods. And he's saying, I don't want that. I want you to only respond to me because I'm one. I'm one. There's only one here. There's not two. There's not three. There's none of that. It's just me. But the oneness of me and the understanding of me is when both of these are joined together. As long as the earth have people on it this worship other gods and committing adultery, and fornication, idolatry, I can't be joined to a harlot. So what I'm asking Israel to do is to change their mind about their idolatry and their harlotry and come to me so I can be united with them. I want to be united with you. I chose you out of all the people of the earth to be united, to be a cod. That's why I told you to Shema Yisrael, Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh Echad. Uh, why does he mention I'm one? Why is he saying that? Because he's letting us know that they're number one, there is no other except for him and secondly he wants to be joined because what he does is in order to join israel to himself there's a letter that he puts in front of this so called so a cod is, is is identified as being one the same root word if he throws a letter on it which i just showed you right here a yod puts this right here it's called yakod this is another word for you to know a cod is is one and yakod means for us to be unified and the yod there means he unifies unity is what yah is talking about unity between us and him unity between a husband and a wife so that they can become one okay so he wants us to be joined with him we don't we don't um we don't have his power in that sense but he's allowing us to to know him through the commandments that he's given us, okay? So this letter Ket is that important. It's one that has to do with um, division, but it also has to do with protection and joining together. And you can see that in these words that I've showed you. Echad and Yakad and Ak and Akot. It's all about unity. It's all about community. The word for unity is found in the word of community. You see? So unity is one. That means to unite, and then you have your word what? Community. And the community is what Yah's interested in. He wants a community. That's a coming together, but the key word here is called communication. That's when you get community, when you all unify together with one another. Unity to unite, you see? And we're uniting that which is on the outside or what's not that's foreign to us with that which is in another space. So us unifying with Yah is making a connection between that which is in the heavens and that which is on the earth. Yah's intention for Israel is to rule. And you can see this in the, I think in the book of um, Psalms, I think it's 82 or 83, where he says, I've called you gods. You guys are gods. And I'm a little disturbed or disappointed in you because you haven't executed righteousness on the earth. And he calls you Elohim. So we share in that, not that we're the power of all powers, but an Elohim in the text, he also identifies as a leader or a teacher or a governor or a judge, you see? So a person who has that great, that great authority and that authority is given to us 
So, but we only can have it when you're united with him. And he wants us to rule for him. And that's a big deal. So for us to learn this language is great because we're understanding the concepts of what our true purpose is. You won't find out what your purpose is until you find out who you are and, and what you are, okay? And where you come from. So I use this picture here to identify the divisions to separate. This is used to divide. It's for protection and it's a wall, okay? But once this curtain comes down or this wall comes down, you're unifying that which is on both sides. Matter of fact, and it's called a ket. Matter of fact, one of the words that's used for uh, what they call um, his uh, appointed times is called a coke. A, okay, a coke. Okay. And that is called um, a statue. When he talks about his laws and his statutes and his commandments, it's a statute. And a statute is what they call an appointed time. You know, it's an ordinance. And an ordinance is when I say that I need you to, you know, come for uh, Sukkot, for example. It's called a festival. That's what a, a coke is. It's a festival. Okay. So in my festivals, what, am, what are we doing? A festival is that which has been separated. Okay. That's what a festival, feast. A feast is that which is separated, comes together. Okay. Because the letter ket here is wall, which means separation. And then this letter Q right here, right? In the Hebrew tongue is called a kof. We'll get to that later. And a kof means um, to gather. So that which has been separated is gathering together. And that which is separate as our people, we are separated during different times. And then we come together in a festival. We all join up together. And that's what's important about our family. Because there's certain times that our father said, As I want to see my sons three times a year. And then also too, I wanna to see my sons and my daughters at certain times of the year, okay? So um, that's another word that we'll get into. But again, you can see it. So when you see this letter in, 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 in the word, okay, let me see. Yeah, oh, thank you. Yeah, it is deep. Um, when, you, when you see how this letter is used, you know, we don't just think, well, it's, it's just ket. No, it has significance. I see this, I see wall. When I hear the, it means division. It means to divide. It means protection. It means wall. It means a gathering. That which is separated, it can be united together. Unification is what Yah's goal is. Unification between men and women is what Yah's goal is. Unity of thought is Yah's goal. So if we have to change our mindsets, and then eventually he's going to be able to come in and he's going to correct our mind, right? But it takes, we have to do our part. And our part is, is what they call willingness. So once we're willing to, to change our minds and to turn from our ways, then Yah says, okay, you, it's, a pre, it's a prerequisite for you to be able to come with me. For us to be unified, you got to change your mind. You, you know, you can't be out there doing the stuff that, you know, you guys been doing. You know, you guys are unclean. You're, you, you've been a whore. You've been sleeping with a whole bunch of other gods, and now you want to have sex with me, and it's not going to happen. You got to wash your body, and then I'm going to put you in seclusion for a while, and after I put you in seclusion, I'm going to bring you out of seclusion, and I'm going to clean you up, and then me and you're going to reunify again, and we're going to be intimate, and our intimacy with Yah is in, in terms of, you know, like a man coming to a woman, our intimacy with Yah is one through the mind. It's through the mind. With our wives and, and women, it's through body. But with Yah, it's through the mind. Adultery is with the body and, and our implements, our tools that we have, our, 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 our body parts. With Yah, it's with the mind. The altar is when we bring something to Yah. He says, bring it to me, but make sure that it's, it, you examine it and make sure that it's whole. Make sure there's no blemish on it. There's no stains. There's nothing wrong with it. Right? Just like when men and women come together, you want someone to make sure that they're clean. And they got to, when, when they draw near and when they approach, so anytime the priests would approach Yah, they have to be clean. They have to wash their, their bodies. And then they have to wash that animal. And then they put it on that altar. That altar is representative of the intimacy. That's the bed. That's the place where you meet Yah, right there. It's the same as when uh, we were supposed to go up on the mount with uh, Moses. And yeah. he told us to leave our wives and to wash ourselves, clean our yeah. bodies, yes. wash ourselves. Yeah. We yes. had to come up. Don't go near Right. Yeah, don't go near. And the reason why is not that the women were unclean 
it's because we were unclean because when a man has a seminal in the mission it is death because the the sperm is alive so once the sperm releases into the air it, it dies okay it dies and it dies on you and it dies on her and so you both become unclean okay so it's not that the woman is unclean it's what the process of our intimacy with a woman become makes us unclean and just like when David, when he went to war and he went to the priest and he said, I want to have some bread to eat. And he asked him, are you guys clean? He said, yeah, we never get unclean when we go to war. We keep ourselves pure. So because in order for them to be around Yah, they had to remain clean. And so our people doesn't understand this concept because we've been in filth so long that we think that we can approach the creator any way we want to. And he's saying, no, that's not the case. Cleanliness mm -hmm. next reality is Yes, that's what mama used to say. <laughs> so here's the thing. The next letter, anyone have any questions? Okay, this next letter is called, uh, is here anciently is called Thet. Thet, okay, but they call it Tet. T-E-T. -E okay, you'll see, I'll write it out for you, Tet. So last one is Ket. This one is called Tet. So we'll go Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalet, Hey. Wa Zion Ket Tet Ket Tet Okay Ket Tet So the first one is Ket and Ket is the eighth letter. Zion is seven. You got to play a game. This is eight. This is Tet is nine. Okay Tet. Okay So this is called Tet in its modern sense. Okay In its ancient sense is called Thet. We'll talk a little bit more about that later, grammatical stuff. It says the original pictograph, because it's talking about pictures, is a container or of a wicker or clay, okay? The containers were very important. They're a very important item in the nomadic Hebrews. And what does it mean? Well, that's where they used to store things and they stored their grains and other items, their cookware, you know, their utensils. So they had wicker baskets and uh, they were used as nets for catching fish. They used it for catching fish. The meaning of this is also as basket or a container, and that has determined for storing for storing things or clay. So, what it does, it, it this letter has to do with um, uh, which we'll call it uh, containing something. Okay, that's what it has to do with the container, and the and and it's shaped that way, so it's easy for you to remember because it has a shape that that looks like that. So let me show if I can share what that is right here. I'm going to show you what the shape is so you can get a, get an idea. Uh, the shape. All right, so here it is, the clay basket, the tet. And so this is what it looked like anciently. It just looked like a circle with a, this in it. It just means a container, okay? And But this is what it looked like when it, when it started changing. You know, then over here. You know, it looks like you could go inside it and hold something. You go right through there and you hold it, container. So that's why it has that shape because it's trying to transform itself um, into the the the, uh, the clay basket. Okay, it's a tet for the letter t t t t t t t t for the letter t t t t t. You already know the sound. T t t. You already know the sound. It's already there. So you don't have to learn the sound of Tet. You already know what it is. You just need to know what the name is. That's all. And you need to know what it means and what it looks like. That's all. So I'm just familiarizing us with everything that we already, that, that, we, that we forgot, okay? And so this clay basket is what we're talking about. So now we know, where do you put a clay basket? Oh, that's right. You're gonna put it in a tent. And a tent has a wall, and then you got some other outside stuff where you do your your agriculture, and then your tent. So your tent's being held down with a peg, so it doesn't move. And then you're standing outside your tent with your hand raised, and you got a tent door, and you got a clay basket that, that's in the tent. <laughs> or you use that out for outside. You understand for containing something, right? Perfect. Now, the last letter we're going to go over. Okay, let me resume here, give you the share. The last letter that we're going to go over, and I'll show you what this looks like, is this. So, that's where they put their fish in. They will put their, um, 
stuff they cook with or whatever. They carry stuff with it. They put it on their head. So you can see now when we look at those pictures of the people in Africa and places like that, they always had baskets and things were woven. Everything that we had, we made with our hands. This wasn't something they went to cost plus to go get. They made them. Okay, so everything we that we did, we have to do it with our own hands. So when you do something with your own hands, you put some work and energy into it. You put some effort into it. You would strengthen it and make sure that it was strong enough to hold what you want it to be. Okay, so a container and basket. So when we talk about this, when we think about this letter TET, we're talking about organization. That's what containers are used for. It's for organization. It's not just throw stuff in there some things but not all things storage so we see that our people were very orderly they didn't have stuff laying all around you know today you know you, in your home you should have things orderly you know you should have things organized and they should be in storage bins and stuff like that they should just be randomly all over the place and so the reason why this is important because this has to do with a mindset this has to do with a mindset okay a mindset. You don't have storages that are that full of things that don't belong there. The things that's supposed to go in one basket doesn't go into all baskets. You got to know how to keep things separate. Okay, so that's what it's used for too. So you can see again how Yah is using culture to talk and teach his people. We learn by how we live. I need you to understand this. We learn by how we live. Our behavior determines how we live our ideas and our thoughts determine how we how we live do we are we organized are we all scattered like that abstract picture i showed you or are we living in a way that's that's very productive you know working outside is it is it one that's organized when we put things in baskets and we got you know i know i key does hardwood floors are your tools all bunched up together or all the tools that you need for certain jobs and certain ba and certain boxes or all your screwdrivers where they're supposed to be. When you need them, you can go get them. You know, when you got your sandpaper for your sanders, are they all mixed up and you know, are they organized? You know, when I when I was doing my businesses, I had to make sure that everything was organized. You know, I don't you don't supposed to mix anything. Going back to the Torah, so Yah's teaching Israel how to live through what, through how they live. How what is it? Why the Torah is all in here. And so it's not just words that he spoke to us, it's how we lived. And then again, here is the letter for the Tav, I mean the Tet. It means to go in, okay, to, to be inside the container. This here looks like a heart. You know, some people, oh, that looks like a heart. You know, it looks like a heart. It's not a heart, it's a Tet. But you can remember it has a heart because it means that which you put in a container, that which is within you. In the, um, in the block form of the Hebrew, it's written like this. Okay, so you can see all different kinds of ways that they can write it. They can cursive it. They can make it still a container. Something can still be put in. Okay, so you'll see this letter a lot. Okay, you'll see it. You're like, oh, what, what, so what does it mean? You'll be like, oh, I know what it means. Okay, last and final letter for us is this Yod. The ancient is called a Yod. Okay, Yod has to do with a hand. Okay, because that is the actual name for the word hand yod okay hand and the hand the early semitic pictograph of this is an arm okay and a hand is connected okay so what we have here is an elbow and it has this and it has a hand like that that's what it looks like okay this is your hand and this is your arm okay and what do you use the hand for well it says the meaning of this letter is to work because that's what the hand is used for. And that's why it's connected. Thou should not commit, you know, do any work on the Shabbat. This is with your hand. Or to make and to throw. Okay. The function of it. Those are the functions of the hand. You work with it. You make stuff with it. Like the basket we just saw. You put up the tent with it. You build a tent with it. You actually throw things. You know, you can throw a, a, an arrow. You can throw a spear. You can throw a rock. You can throw a stone. Which y'all talks about if you throw something and hit someone and kills them, and you found out that it was big enough to kill someone and you threw it, you're gonna die because you should have known better. The modern Hebrew name of is Yud, which they got a Yud, but you know, that's the Ashkenazi, you know, call it a Yod, call it a Yud. It's still take those vowels out of it, 
Take the A out of it, it's still a yod and a dalit. Take the U out of it, it's still a yod and a dalit. Take the O out of it, it's still a yod and a dalit. So it doesn't matter if you call it a yod. You don't matter if you call it a yod or yod or yud. It doesn't matter because what it is, it's a, a hand, an R. It's derivative if it's a two letter, meaning yod, meaning a hand. The original name of the name, the original name for the letter. So the original name of this letter is called a yod. And, and that right there means hand. It's always a reminder. Yod, okay? Hand. That's what it means. Okay. What do you use your hands for? Work, make, and throw, but also too. They call us what? The Yadim. Yuhudim. And it has to do with what? Praise. Use your hands for praise. You lift your hands up in praise. You open your hands up to receive so they can give praise. That's giving. Your hands could be used to give. And your hands can also be used to what? The hand can also be used to receive. Which a lot of us have a problem with. Because we don't really understand and know how to receive. We haven't been taught. We feel bad about it. I was a kid who used to go to people's house and ask me, are you hungry? You want something to eat? I go, uh, no, I'm okay. I'd be starving to death. I don't know why I didn't say. I never wanted to be a burden to anybody. Are you thirsty? Would you like something to drink? No, that's okay. I've always had a problem with receiving. But I am a giver. That's for sure. But I'm having to learn how to receive. So the hand does, it, it's, it's supposed to be open and it's supposed to be closed. It can be open and closed to give and to receive, okay? And let me tell you something significant about this since it's the last letter. This hand is for these things of working and throwing and also praise and receiving. When you pray, a lot of us pray and we don't understand what this position of these hands mean. These hands like this, can also mean to put something in it, to give, something to give, to receive. It also means to offer up. You can put your hands this way when you're praying. Turn them up this way, like you see. So that means that you're giving praise, but your hands are open to receive. Ask God to fill your hands. That's not just with spiritual feeling. That is with physical feeling. Fill my hands. I read in the one of the Torah portions where it talks about how after the year of, of tithing, how they would gather all the fruits and vegetables and they would put it in a basket and they would set it before Yah and they would make a declaration about how he gave this land to their ancestors and how he made he kept his promise. And that fruit was, and that the grains and everything that they gave was representative of Yah's promise. It's not until our hands are with something in it to offer Yah that proves that Yah has given us something. You understand? And what we want Yah to do is to fill our hands with that which he gives to us that we can give back to him. When he asks for us to give him a tithe or a first of our fruits, what he's talking about, I only want you to give me what I gave you in your land. That's all I want from you, because when you give me what I gave you, it shows that I've kept my promise. See, when you when you say that I gave you something that some some man put in your hand and you said I gave it to you, you're getting a little confused. Because the fact of the matter is what I promised your ancestors was land and descendants. And I promised them a land. And that's where I want you to go. So when you get whatever you get out of that land, you'll bring me the first fruits of it like your father promised me. Your father, Yaakov, said that if you look out for me, you feed me, and you give me clothing, I'll give you a first of everything that comes from me. That's what he said. That's prior to the Torah. That's a, that's, that's a promise that your father made to me. That's what he wanted. He said, if you would give me food, put something in my hand, I would give you the first of it and by him giving the first of it 
Yah says, thank you. And the people that serve Yah, they will receive the first that was given to Yah. That's why the Kohanim received the first of everything. Because they're, they're servants of Yah and they were working for him. They needed to be paid for their efforts. And Yah is telling us this is how they're going to get paid. Not just in monetary, they're going to get paid in food and grain and olive oil and, and lambs and goats and rams and skins and all that kind of stuff. Yod is very powerful. And in grammar, it represents, it represents the word he. It means he. Okay. Let me share that again. I forgot to do that. He. And we'll get into the grammar. But this is the first letter of Yah's name, Yohei Wai. So when we think about the significance of his name, Yohei, his hand, combining, behold, 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 his hand, he, he's the self-existing one. Behold, look at him, everything he does, okay? A yoke, a hand. So when you see this letter in the beginning of any word, it means he. Because the he has to do with the hand. And it's masculine. And that's why it's called a yod. Okay. And when we talk about our hand, you can make it hands by just adding a yadim. <laughs> yadim. Here's a yod, meaning hand. And then if I say I want hands, I just put I am on there. Yadim. God damn. This here means more than one. And that's how easy this language is. Once you find out how to say hand, yad. Then you say your hands, yadim. So when you raise your hands to Yahweh, you don't say yadims, you just say yadim. Because that's what it, that's what it is. Your hands, these are called yadim right here. This is yadim right here. That's yadim. Yadim. Yad. 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 These are Yadim. One hand is Yad. Yadim, I'll make it two. It's both hands. Okay. Interesting enough, the hands and the work and everything that he gave us hands to do work with. He doesn't like Israel beating each other up and punching each other in the face. He didn't put our hands, we don't supposed to grab people and beat them up. Our hands, our hands don't supposed to be that. We're supposed to be a peaceful people. That's why I'm having a hard time letting go of, um, you know, not hard time, but yeah, has moved upon my heart and said, well, you know, you really were in the MMA and you like boxing and stuff, but I want you to see what they're doing with their hands. What they're doing to their, with their hands is they're destroying the image that I've given. The things that represent what I'm after. I mean, I'm not a man, but I, I gave you an image. What I wanted you to look like. And now you're using your hands to destroy that. And people are getting paid to beat each other up. Okay. I don't want you to use your hands to throw people. If I need you to kill someone, right? And I put you put put work to Israel, because I did send Israel to go in there and kill people. And they did do that. So there is a time for that. Okay. But in terms of us working among ourselves in our community. Our hands are not supposed to be put on, on, on our brothers and sisters. We're not supposed to do that. But it does happen. I won't say that it doesn't because there's a Torah that talks about how, if it does happen, what, what's supposed to happen. <laughs> and our cultis are supposed to be, our culti supposed to be careful how they use their hands. Because if, a, if, a, if a, an occulti ever took her hand and she grabbed a man by his private, his private parts, Yah says you're supposed to not cut her hand off, like some people say. He's supposed to go in and cut the palm of her hand out. He's supposed to cut that part of her hand out, not her whole entire hand. That's that's a, a mistranslation. The translation is to cut the palm of her hand out. And so she won't be able to use that palm anymore. She won't be able to close her hand anymore. She'll have a hand, but she won't be able to close it as a reminder of what she grabbed. See? See? <laughs> right <laughs> praise the holy one of israel any questions because i'm really enjoying this <laughs> anybody got any questions 
Now, I, man, he, he, this is just, man, exciting, man, to learn it and just soaking it all up like a sponge. Wonderful. I have something else for you. I want to, I want to show you something. I, um, I wanted you to know something, and I'm going to show it to you. We're going to go over this prayer later on, but I'm going to teach you this prayer in Hebrew so you'll know what it is. Okay. Can you see it right now? No. Oh, you can't? Okay, let me see. I don't know what happened right there. I'm going to teach you this prayer. Let's see. Right. Oh. All right. All right. So um, here we have uh, what they call, and here's my email. I, I've, you guys already sent my, I already sent you my email. So kingleanprinciples at gmail.com. You guys need to send me anything, ask me any questions, um, send it to their kingleanprinciples at gmail.com. This is a prayer I'm going to teach you. Shema Yisrael, Yahweh, Eloheinu, Yahweh, Echad, Ua Havata, Eth, Yahweh, Eloheka, Vakol Levaveka, Uva Kol Navshika, Uva Kol Neodika. Basically, listen, Israel, Yahweh, our Elohim is one, and you are to love Yahweh with all your heart and with all your, your soul and with all your strength. Okay. But I want you to know that everything that I'm teaching you, you didn't know this, but you already know it. <laughs> you already know it because a lot of times we get kind of like you know like man this is scary i don't know that. i've never no you already know it you just you haven't been familiarized with it lately it's just in you though it's already there so i want you to know something about the letter aleph since we've already i don't want to go too far where you will forget this because the aleph is silent except when there's vowels beneath it that's a rule okay this is the rule aleph is silent so it's not the letter A. It's not the letter A. It's not the letter A. So I know in English is A, B, C, D, E, F, G. No, this is Aleph is silent. So what is Yah telling us about this letter? If it's silent, it doesn't have a sound. What is he saying? <laughs> it's the first letter that's used in his name as his title of who he is. He's a powerful one. His name is El Elohim. So he's silent, okay? And this means strength. So guess what strength is? Strength is silence. That's what strength is. True strength is silent. It means you have the ability to speak, but you don't. That's like that old school saying, the strongest one is always the quietest one in the room. That's right. And they always told us to watch that one because that's the most dangerous one. Right, right. Yeah. So when you Okay, and but when Yah does speak, the power will speak. Okay, and that's why Yah doesn't talk to us uh, through words all the time anymore. He doesn't speak to us this way because we don't want to hear it from him. We want to, He said, "Please don't don't let him say anything." <laughs> but the Aleph is silent. That's a grammatical rule. I want to tell you about this letter, except for when, except when there's vowels beneath it. All right, so I'm going to give you a couple of examples. So we have a few minutes left. I'm going to show you something right quick. Under the Aleph, you're going to have this uh, little symbol right here. I'm not going to tell you what the name of it is. There is a name for it. It has a name, but who cares right now what that name is? You don't want to put that into your, your download. You don't, want to, you don't want your memory filled with stuff that's not necessary. Okay. But anyway, all you need to know about it is this is a long vowel sound called ah. Like ah. <laughs> as in father okay it's a long sound ah so ah can be said in a long way like ah or it could be short ah or it'd be even shorter ah it depends on how long you hold it okay so it's ah 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 okay that's how it happens so when you think about this word or this in particular symbol it's ah when you see this it's ah. This is not ah. That's not ah. This is ah. This right here tells you how to say ah. Okay? As in the word other. 
father, father, okay? Father. Now, there's another one that has an ah sound, but now this is the shorter one. So the long one has this here underneath, and the short one has nothing. It's just a straight line. So that's a ah, but it's short. If it's long, it's this one. It's as simple like that. If it's short, it's just by itself. So they're both ah, but it depends on how long you say one. One is short, one is long. You could think about short as being a minus sign, like we'll subtract a little bit from it, you know, okay? These are called nakuds, which are vowel points, okay? Um, so we know that Aleph is silent, right? So I'm gonna need class participation. We know that Aleph is silent. Let me get right here. Which one? I'm gonna have over here, this is gonna be one and this is gonna be two. Okay, so every time I look at something, I'll say this is one on this side and this is two. So I want you to tell me which one are we do we want? What sound are we looking for? Which one? One or two? One, 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 one. One, good job. All right. Which one? One or two? Two. Good. One or two? Two. Mm -mm. One, no. one, 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 one. Nope. Tricked you. This is not this. And this is not this. These are not ah sounds. <laughs> I didn't introduce you to this. I didn't introduce you to this either. I introduced you to this. And I introduced you to this. So why did I do this? This is an exercise that I created. I'm not a psychologist, but I kind of know how to, how to deal with stuff, okay? The reason why I did it this way, don't feel bad. It's okay to say, I want everyone to, to say this to themselves. You don't have to say it outside, but here it is. Say this to yourself. It's okay to make mistakes. Say it. It's okay to make mistakes. Yes, because when I make a mistake, it means I'm learning. Okay? So if you make mistakes, that means that you're learning. Okay? When you don't make a mistake, it doesn't mean that you're not learning. It means that you understand it. <laughs> so once you understand something, you can move on to the next thing. Okay? So the only, I want you, this is something that I've learned and I'm teaching. I only want you to focus on that, which I've told you. I don't want you to focus on something that I did not tell you. I put here this to be in opposition to what I said. Because this is the way that Yah is teaching us. If I didn't tell you something and I didn't, and, and I told you what father is, you automatically should go right here because you would know what that I is. So I'm training your brain to know that this is ah. Over here, this is foreign to you. You don't know what this is. And I didn't tell it to you. I'm only going to tell you what I want you to know. So you can learn. And once you learn it, you can understand it. So again, one or two. One. One. Good job. One or two. Two. Good. One or two? One. Okay. One or two? Two. One or two? Neither. Neither. Good. You know why? Because you understand something now. Guess what you understand? You understand what this sound is now. Because that sound goes with this understanding. Of father. Father. You don't know what this is. It doesn't matter what it is. Only can... Be only concerned with the stuff that's put in front of you that you were taught. Never go off on anything else. Because what our, our brains do is we're trying to look to, to find, to be right. And we don't need to be right. We don't need to be right. What we need to do is, find, is remember what we were taught. Okay? So this is a part of learning. And it's something that Yah showed me about us. He usually says sometimes people, when you guys learn, we're so anxious anxious to learn that we want to be right 
And he's like, no, I'm, I want you to be wrong. So when you guys made that mistake, he's great. Congratulations. Because now you know, wait a minute. If I make a mistake, that means that I need to continue to learn. I haven't accepted what that sound is. If I, the, the vowels that I'm teaching you today is part of your learning. And, I'll, and like you see, I can do with one vowel. A ah sound. It has two little ways that it looks. It has this long look right here. You know, let me see. It has, it has, it has this look, right? And it has this one. You know, one with it, right? It's it's and what was the sound is missing? The ah for father. I want you to remember that word, father. I want you to remember that that ah goes with father. There's another ah, shorter one, father. Okay. One, two, nothing. I didn't introduce those to you. How about this one? One. How about this one? One. Two. One. Two. Neither. One. Neither. Two. Neither. One. Aleph is silent unless it has a vowel underneath it. And the long vowel is ah, as in father. You have another ah, the short vowel ah. Still a ah, but it's just shorter. The aleph is silent, except when there's vowels beneath it. Okay, give yourself a hand. <laughs> Ooh, I love teaching this because it's beautiful. Okay, and then look, next time we're gonna go over another one. But right now we're gonna stick with what we just went with. All right, you guys like that? So wrap your mind around that. Just wrap your mind around it. I wanna share something else with you. I want to share this with you. These are the slides and stuff that I've, I've made and they're little teaching tools that I have. Um, and so again, um, there's just some rules, okay? So in any kind of vocabulary and culture, there's rules to the things to under, understand how things work, okay? I call it my Hebrew lesson 101. It talks about some vowels. We, we're not gonna go through all of it. I don't wanna over stimulate your brain because I'm your brain is really working hard. Okay, so let me go to the next one. All right, so you've already learned this. I put it in that hot pink to kind of get your brain to go, woo. So now it's ah, long like father, ah, and you know, short. All right, um, don't worry about that. We're not gonna talk about that. We're not gonna talk about that. Um, what do I wanna do? Mm, nah, nah, you're not ready for that. All right, so we've already learned that. All right, good. That's all I wanted to teach you today, all right? So in summary, in summary, what we have is Aleph, Bed, Gimel, Dalet, Hey, Wab, Zion, Ket, Ted, Yod. So now what I want you to do is I want you to put the other five fingers that you have, and I want you to put the letters on them. You know, if you want to, you can tape them on your fingers if you want. I don't care. You can write them on your fingers with a, an erasable marker, okay? I don't care what finger you start with. I want one of those fingers to be a wa, okay? I want a wa on one of them. I want a, a the sound Zion, Zion on one. So wa, Zion. And then I want the next one to be the ket. Ket is one of the fingers. And then the tet would be the fourth finger and then the yod will be the fifth finger and you should remember that because yod or yod has to do with the hand okay so in your in your five fingers so you got five on one side which is aleph bet gimel dalit hey you already got that now we're going to go vav zion ket tet yod 
So you can memorize the first 10. So you go, Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalit, Hey. You know, and you say, well, what's two? Bet, three, Gimel, Dalit, four, five, Get. You know, so know the numbers, okay? Put a number on the letter, okay? On your sixth finger, that should be your Vav, the Wa, excuse me, the Wa. That's your Wa. Wa, 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 Wa. Don't go any till you know what that six is, Wa. Okay? Then you go Wa, and then you got to go Zion. That's seven. Zion, seven. Say it, seven, Zion. Seven, Zion, right? Eight. Ket, 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 ket. Tet, 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 tet. Yo, 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 yo. Okay? Vav, Zion, ket, tet, yo. Wa, Zion, ket, tet, yo. Wa, Zion, ket, tet, yo. Wa, Zion, ket, tet, yo. Yo, tet, ket. Zion, yo. Um, wa. You could, you got to mix it up. So that's your homework. Okay? So you go, Alabed, Gimel, Dela. Hey, you got that down. Alabed, Gimel, Dela. Hey. Alabet gimel dela hey, vav zayin kete yo. Make a song out of it. Alabet gimel dela hey, vav zayin kete yo. Your yod is your hand, your yod. Okay, so that's how you do that, and that's and then you're gonna go to our next one. So today you have ten letters underneath your belt. Today you found out that the wa is used over fifty thousand times. And it's used to make things connect together. We found out today that the scrolls are not divided into books. They're just the way. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, princess. Thank you. So it's, it's, it's what it is. We found out today that the Holy One of Israel, um, he's, you know, he shows us how things are connected and how people are running games on us. And he wants us to come out of that. He showed us today that Eastern thought versus Western thought. And what's the benefit of changing and turning our mindset? So when he talks about repenting, <laughs> which they use that word shuv for repent, it means to turn back from your captivity. But in our turning, we turn our mindset. That's the thing that has to be changed. Everything starts and everything ends here. So this is the most important part that we're talking about. This is what we're talking about, okay? So you have to remember that, that it is about the mind, okay? We learned the significance of being close to Yah. Why he has to clean us up? Because we've been a, a bunch of whores. <laughs> and once we have done that, he goes, oh, you, you can't come back to me yet. I have to wash you and prepare you and clean you and keep you in seclusion for a while before I touch you. And then after that, we'll come back together. So we are going to get back together, but just not now. I have You have to go through a cleansing process, okay? And that happens with, remember, I told you, with intimacy with Yah is the brain, okay? So if you want to cheat on him, you cheat on him with this. That's where he's talking about. <laughs> so if you want, that's where it's at. This is where it's at, okay? And it begins here, and then you play it out. So that's what it is, okay? The God that we follow is the one that de determines our behaviors. We found out today that our Elohim has used our living conditions and the way that we, we maneuver and what we think and how we get our food and how we, we live in our tent and how we do things, our animals. Everything is used to teach us about him. So that's the significance of this language. Um, we learned a little bit about some vowels today, just one. Or, you know, we're actually two. Ah, the sound is ah. We learned about that. And you'll learn more about that. Don't worry if you forget. Just remember the word father, your father. Fa ah, that's all you want. Long and short. Ah ah. Remember the one that has the little cross or T? That's the longer one, the shorter one. And don't worry if you forget it, you'll get it. Okay. So that's my class today. I've, I've been on here for two hours straight. And I want to thank you. I want to thank our, our host here, um, Pincus. Um, Thank you for providing a platform. I want to thank each and every last one of you for taking out of time in your schedule today to come and learn about this language. Hallelujah. Well, praise the Holy One of Israel.
Do you know who you are? Do you even know where you come from? Do you even know who the creator of the heavens and the earth is? These are some of the questions that so-called black people ask on a daily basis. And if you ain't know, we are the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Black people are the real Jews. We are the biblical Israelites. You want to learn your history? You want to know the truth? Repent and turn back to the Most High. We are Israel, and we have the heir to the throne. The heir to the throne. Phineas Gad Israel, heir to the throne. Album features The Deacon, Sleepy LaFleur, No Name Servant, Shamaria Ben Israel, China McLeod, Rasta, Mr. Mosley, and many more. Album releases on all online platforms, October 16th, 2020.